to the Life Legacy and Leadership Podcast, uh, the Brook Hill Podcast here. Today's guest, we have a very special guest. This is the GOAT alumni of all GOAT alumni. This is the, okay, Jesse Metz. Ah, oh, I learned your name earlier. How do I say it? <laughs> Teutle. Teutle. Very good. Muy bien. Muy bien. <laughs> All right. Our husband, Eric, is teaching me Spanish, which we will talk about that just a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, Jesse, welcome to the podcast. Jesse was the Arabian senior counselor. What yes. were your years that you were here? 2013 to 2016. 2013 to 2016. And then yep. you came to camp as a... Nine-year-old. I came to all the two weeks. You you came to all the two weeks. Yes. Okay. Yes. Is that what y'all's fan were y'all two yeah, week people? Yeah, we were two week people until okay. it was gone, and then I think I graduated like Camp Four because we tried to stay here for Fourth of July every time. Okay. All yeah. All right. I yeah. love that. Okay. Well, welcome to the podcast, Jesse. We are so glad to have you today. Can't wait to get into your life and all the different things. Mm -hmm. Glad to be here. But before we do that, we always start the podcast with a game. Okay. All right. I know the Metzes are game players. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. Uh, a yeah. Little bit. I think everybody <laughs> jealously watches y'all's uh, family time where y'all are playing all these different games and stuff. So, mm -hmm. okay. So we're going to play a game. It's the Brookhill podcast. So we're going to play a Brookhill game. Okay. You have three categories, and you can go. You don't have to pick a category. You can go in between all three to get as much information as you want. Okay. It is camp songs, all camp songs. Doesn't matter if they're still here or not. So you get the alumni gets any song, camp cabin names, and activities. Okay. And it doesn't have to be current. It can be current or old, whatever. Just any activity that's been at Brook Hill. So you get all three categories to see. All right. Now, Tyler, can we throw up the leaderboard? Um, real quick, just for her to see the pressure that she has. This is the leaderboard. Okay. And you get 30 seconds. So that means the person who won was doing over an answer a second. That's pretty good. Okay. That's pretty impressive. No pressure. All right. I don't see any Kansas City people up there, so you are representing your state alone. Soon to on change. This. Okay. <laughs> All right. Here we go. So you will begin, and then the timer will be thrown up there. Okay? Okay. You got it? Songs. Cabin names and activity names. All right. You begin when you're ready. Okay. Hodgepodge, fun swim, archery, riflery, water rides, horseback, the barn, uh, nature activity, Arabians, Percherons, Lipazons, Palominos, Pintos, Galasinos, Phillies, Buckskins, Mustangs, Mavericks, Hackneys, Pacers, Roans. Blazers, crafts, drama, laser tag, uh, big lake. Oh, <laughs> I officially had 26. Oh, really? That's, is that enough to get on the board? I don't think so. I think it was 27. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, you were one crazy. away. One away. Do we get a redo? Do it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> When you come back, when you come back. I didn't even do one camp song. No, you had a whole, I you had forgot, another 40. I forgot a whole category. You could have been in the 70s right there. Okay, for That's playing, okay. we got a little gift for you. Okay. All right, we got some brand new swag here Love from BR it. Merch from okay. Native. And then these are from Girly Girl right here. These are our um, black, we call them manlies. Do I open it now? Oh, sure, why not? Doesn't matter. So, nice. Yeah, just just check it out right oh. there. Yep. That's it, an upgrade for me. I think mine is like half this size. Yes. This is good. Yes. The, we we always encourage people to hydrate around here, so that's why. Very we necessary. Have the gallon of water there. So. Nice. All right. Great job playing the game. Okay, so Jesse, let's talk life, legacy, and leadership. Let's talk about um, how'd you get here? How'd you get here to camp? Uh, y what do you have? One sibling. Two yeah, siblings. Um, one plus six. <laughs> <laughs> so I have six siblings um, and a boatload of cousins. So actually. H how many cousins? Give me a number. Okay. So underneath my grandma, like under my grandparents' tree here, there's like a hundred and I think 40 and counting. And I actually might be off on that number. We just keep expanding. We're an entire little city in Arkansas somewhere. <laughs> yes, that's <laughs> so, incredible. Yeah, so cousin-wise, I don't know, probably like 90 to 100 cousins. 90 to 100 
cousins. Probably actually maybe more like 110, but that's like second cousins as well, but even some of my second cousins are close to my age. So, Tyler, how many cousins yeah. you have? Yeah. I think like 26. 26. Uh-huh. And they have 100. Oh, and yeah. And then now there's married people with kids. That's ridiculous. Yeah. And that's only on my mom's side. I mean, that's <laughs> not even my dad's side. My mom's one of 10. My dad's one of six. Wow. So, I mean, on my dad's side, there's less cousins, but there's probably like 60 of us. Okay. That's an estimation. But I yeah. love that. Well, I know you're really good friends with my sister, Rebecca. Yes. Right? Uh, yeah. So it's so funny because I, I always tell people, my sister, Melissa, and they're like, what? You mean Rebecca? Or if they know Melissa, I'm like, my sister, Rebecca. They're like, who? Mm-hmm. You know, they, nobody knows both of them. But mm-hmm. I have two sisters. Yes. And we don't have that many cousins, right? And we rarely see each other, right? <laughs> yeah. And you guys, like, see each other all the time, and there's hundreds of you. It, it's amazing. Yeah, it's weird when we get back together, we hug each other and, like, get excited, and everyone's like, didn't you just see each other yesterday? And we're like, yeah, but it's been a day. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We just genuinely get excited to be together, even if it's the same thing every year or every week. Like, they just got together for Father's Day, previously for Memorial Day. You know, like, every weekend they're getting together, and all it is is grilling out at my mom and dad's house, and everyone's super excited to be there. So. That's so fun. And it's, how it's many? And how many of them came to camp, and how did y'all get to camp? Um... Let's see. I think all my siblings except for one came to camp. Um, wow. She's she's the runt of the family. Oh, poor girl. <laughs> Don't talk about her. No. <laughs> Just kidding. She's great. <laughs> um, but actually, our cousins, my aunts and uncles came to the seminars, and the women's and men's seminars, and then they heard about the camp, um, and so they brought their kids. And then my cousins, the Olsons, name drop there um they introduced the camp to us and then we all kind of expanded and told our other cousins and so we would trek down here three days in advance and camp out at lake washita and do like a little family camp out for the weekend and then we had three giant 15 passenger vans one was for all the luggage and then two of them were for the kids and we would just you know have a great time and camp out and then come two weeks of camp the dads would drive us down, and then the moms would all come and pick us up. So it was a great but time. Don't don't tell your dad that we now do a multi fan, multi child discount. Oh, so. uh, I, I won't. <laughs> Back then, it was like, oh, you got twelve kids. Sorry, we were going door to door selling chocolates. <laughs> Did you really? Bills. We would do whatever we could to make money. I remember the year my mom said, "I don't think y'all are going to get to go to camp. We can't afford that many." And so, I mean, we started garage sales lemonade stands whatever to try i was nannying kids at the age of 12 just to try (laughs) to try and get to camp so we didn't miss a single year if we could help it so was there like a deal like y'all had to pay half or was it generally yeah if we could pay half i mean and obviously they knew how bad we wanted it they really tried they really helped out but we had to put in the work to get here but, you know, how cool is that, though, Jesse? How cool is it? Like, that had to have taught you guys so much. And you probably didn't complain about camp, right? I mean, you know, as kids, we complain about the silliest little things. Mm-hmm. But when you have skin in the game, right, it was your camp, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, I think if you have to put money forth for anything, you value it more anyways. So they they taught us a lot already about the value of money and work and like we didn't get things handed to us. I got my first phone at 17 because that's when I got my first real job. I drove a 15 passenger van to high school because I didn't have a own, my own car. I mean, I was that. That's amazing. That girl with what, the giant car at what, school. What, what, <laughs> like, what was that like showing up to school in a 15 passenger van? You know, I tried to just own it. Um, we called it the party bus. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, I would end up at, it was my senior year because junior year I rode with Gabe and he we had a um, Chevy Caprice Classic. <laughs> beautiful car <laughs> right there um and it smoked out on us like if you if you turned it on three times or more it would just smoke and you <laughs> you had a limit to how many times you could use that car so I got the van my year um and we had open lunch for senior year and so I remember 
I didn't even know half these people in my high school. And they'd be like, we're going to go to lunch in the party bus with Jesse today. <laughs> and they'd just <laughs> jump in my car and I'd be taking everybody to Arby's. And I was like, maybe I should start a donation pile for the gas that I'm <laughs> like. That thing is a gas guzzler. So, but it was always really fun just driving around places and getting out of the giant van. And it's just me. Like I go to the grocery store, I go to get a coffee and I pull up. And people probably look at this giant car and then just me getting in and out of it. I mean, it was like, <laughs> what is this girl doing with this giant van? I loved it. It's a very young looking mother over there. You know, that's yeah. what they're thinking. Well, I felt like I owned the road. People tried to cut that's me amazing. off. I said, mm, look what I have. <laughs> so. so what was your job? You said you had a job at 17 to help pay for your cell phone. What was your job? Um, I was a waitress. Okay. I served pizza. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's where you learned it all. That's where I learned it all. Yes. I actually loved that job. That's where I met like my core group of friends to this day. We've been friends for like 12 years. Um, we all were servers there at one point. And yeah, after that, I switched over to working for like a preschool as a teacher's aide. But serving, being a waitress was my favorite. See, I, th so. I think this generation is just missing those moments mm -hmm. of growth, mm -hmm. right? They're missing, you know, I don't know if the minimum wage has really knocked them out of the workforce. Like if you're a business owner, you have to decide, do I want to hire? Because, you know, when we hire these camp counselors, you know, they just, they've never really worked a lot of jobs, right? Yeah. I mean, they're, you know, especially when they're first starting out with us. So we're teaching probably more than they're adding value, right? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But after a couple of years, they're really killing it, you know? Right. And by the time they're, you know, really taking on responsibility here, they know a lot. Yeah. But they got those valuable lessons early on. And I just feel like young people are missing out on those moments. Oh, yeah. Whether it's like you said, their parents are paying for all of it. Right. Right. Or, um, you know, whatever it is, they're just not going out and getting jobs. For sure. And they're just missing what you learn, you and your siblings, to pay for camp. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a different world out there for sure. And I think... I think even with just people working from home a lot more, there's there's not that get out and go, get out and find something, that interaction, that desire to. I mean, personally, I can't be in the house for more than like an hour. I got to go do something, you know, like something worthwhile. And actually, since I was 12, like I said, I was babysitting to make money for things. I mean, and I think also, people have less kids now, so maybe they can afford to pay for things like that for their kids. Whereas having seven kids, being a nurse and my dad in medical sales, I don't think that was a luxury. It was kind of just figure it out, right. you know? Right. So, but yeah, I totally agree. I think things have changed. Hmm. It definitely, I definitely think I learned my work ethic from here. I mean, I have to credit a lot of the work ethic that I have from Brook Hill mm -hmm. and the way that they taught us to work and not complain and not escalate situations, you know, remain calm and just see a need, fill a need. I think most of that was, I really credit that to here. But it, it definitely does start in the home. I mean, it started with us too. We valued money. We valued things because we put our own sweat and tears into that. So it's so good. Yeah, it's so good. So you get to camp. Who's the first one in your family that got to camp? Probably Maddie, my oldest sister. Maddie. I think okay. she came when she was in her teens. So she was kind of on her way out. OK, because I think she only came one or two times okay. with like Marie Olson. Yeah, Cause they're the same. I know age. Marie. I feel bad that I don't know Maddie. Yeah. Sorry, Maddie. I, I, I think she's I think she knows your sister. OK. You're Melissa. Old. Yeah, she, I think she okay. knows Melissa. I think they were like wrote letters to each other a few oh, times. That's cool. Random. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. Um, and then let's see, Nellie. She's the one that didn't come. Uh, yeah, I do her. know. Ne I do know the Nellie name. I actually didn't know you the know, Maddie name. Nellie came to a few little conferences here okay. and there with okay. our church or like groups like okay. that. She would come down every now and then. She okay. just didn't ever come to camp. Okay. She wasn't a camp kid. All right. Man. So. It's not for everybody. That's okay. So you arrive on the scene in what grade? Um, I think I was out of third or fourth grade. Because as a two-weeker, you had to be a little bit older. You had to be out of the fourth grade. Yeah, and it, so that's then still, fourth grade. We use that rule today still. Okay, so nine or ten, something okay. like that. Yeah. And did you like it right away? Were you homesick? What was your Loved story? It. 
I had heard already from all my cousins, older siblings about Brook Hill. I was like counting down the days. I don't, I slept on the floor that night because I couldn't fall asleep in my bed. I was too excited to get comfortable. I literally had to sleep on the hardwood floor without a blanket. <laughs> I couldn't sleep. Um, and I got here, I was in the Arabian cabin actually, my very first year with Caitlin Raspberry. Yes, I remember Caitlin. And Shout out to Caitlin. Yes, and we had the same stuffed animal pig, exact same. And that changed the game. I remember walking in, seeing that, and I said, this is going to be the best two weeks of my life. I already love it here. <laughs> so she has a pig, you have a pig. We have a picture together. And that was the connection, was the pig. Was Y'all, were the pig, pig. Pa- Y'all were pig pals. We were pig pals. I was a weird pig person. My email was jessiepigs at gmail.com. I still have it if you want to send me an email. <laughs> I might see it in a few years. That is not still your email. I mean, it's not, I don't use it, but it is still <laughs> up and active. At That's this amazing. Time. <laughs> that is amazing. That would be your email. I loved pigs. I was a weird kid. Okay. Y- yes. No, so seriously, let, let's talk about that. Y- y'all's family is unique. Okay. <laughs> I think unique is a very sweet word to say because sure. we really, y'all are fun, is what y'all are. Y'all are a blast. You are yourselves. And I think that's what embodies a Brook Hill counselor is to be yourself. Truly. And you were like that in the fourth grade. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, you 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 were you were so crazy. In fact, Ty, do, do we have that picture? Y'all throw this picture up there. You you, you got to tell this story, okay? And I, and we'll bounce back to you being a camper in a, in a minute and Caitlin and all your counselors, but okay. So <laughs> this right here, if you are not listening to this on YouTube, you need to go to whatever amount of time this is into the podcast and you have to see this picture. <laughs> this is Jesse. Mind you, this is the girl who drives the 15-passenger van at this moment. Yeah. And this is Mom, Mama Metz. Mm -hmm. This is Jessie. And Jessie, what are you wearing? I'm wearing um, an Amish dress. Why are you Amish? (laughs) I'm I'm not. Why? why At that point of my life, I think I wanted to be. (laughs) (laughs) Like, truly, you did? Truly, I thought, maybe someday I'll marry into the Amish community. (laughs) As if I could do without the air conditioning, I mean... (laughs) So this is not a joke. If you're listening to this, this is not this, a joke. This is true, Jesse. But if you had to know <laughs> Jesse, this is what made her a great camp counselor. Yeah, she, you really believed that. I, you know, um, it started with some books. I read some Amish novels, <laughs> and I just was so I couldn't believe people lived this way. And I'm a reader. I I love reading. So I would get all, like spring break. I had stacks of books in my room. I mean, I was. A like boring kid for a while. I remember Nikki and Gideon, my siblings, coming up and asking me to go play outside, and I was like, "No, I got books to read." And they're like, "You're so boring." <laughs> I was like, "Well, I've got to learn about the Amish." <laughs> <laughs> so, says all kids growing I up. I said, "I got to learn all I can." I I think I kind of bounced from one obsession to another. <laughs> so that was it for a while. Um, I would drive around whatever farm country land I could find in my big passenger van and try to find <laughs> Amish communities. <laughs> so um, this story, um, going back to Becca's younger sister that I'm friends with, she lived here at the time, was going to Christian Ministries Academy, and she invited me to come down to prom with her. And... I didn't drive at this point, didn't have a good enough car. Well, I drove, but not a 15-passenger fan seven hours south. That's not going to happen. So we bought a Greyhound bus ticket. Um, I don't know, like a whopping 40 bucks. And my sister, Nellie, always joked with me that I didn't have um, the guts to go in public in my Amish dresses because sometimes I just wear them around the house. <laughs> So, so this is not your only Amish dress. I had like an Amish nightgown. And actually, I was gifted that by my brother cabin, Philip Lee, Okay. when we were brother and sister cabin. Shout out he to Philip Lee. gifted me an Amish bonnet nightgown set situation. <laughs> he got it off of like a legit Etsy, eBay, Amish made. That's how deep this runs. You can't make this stuff up. This is deeply intertwined with Brookhill. Okay. 
<laughs> I mean, well, Brooke, your your version of Brook Hill. I don't my, know anybody else. No, but. my my life here in okay. Hot Springs. So I took on the challenge and I said, just watch. I will wear my Amish dress the whole ride down to Arkansas. And it was like a night bus. So my mom and dad took me to the station and I made them like act normal. Like this is totally okay. And my mom just couldn't handle it. She kept having to stifle her laughter like every five minutes that she's sending her daughter off at like 9 p.m. with all these like bikers and old veteran men in an Amish dress. (laughs) <laughs> and uh so she asked one of them to take a picture of us so that's why we have this proof and uh i just remember the first <laughs> that's the that's the nightgown and bonnet right there i think that's the staff room that possibly could be the staff room i don't, I don't know it could be or or it's my basement and they okay. look the same <laughs> all right so um <laughs> so anyways i'm on this bus and i um I'm, we're doing good. And then we stop in Fayetteville at the bus stop and on walks an Amish family. I kid you not. No. I kid you not. And she looks at me and smiles, the, the mom. <laughs> and I just immediately faked that I was asleep. <laughs> and I, I couldn't I couldn't believe this horrible situation I was in because I thought, I don't speak German, Dutch, nothing. I, I know enough to get get the facts down but she's gonna know i'm a fraud and who does this like nobody nobody does nobody this nobody does this <laughs> how do i explain to her that it's all from a deeply respectful place <laughs> so i just pretended to be asleep which i was so bummed that i missed my opportunity to speak with this amish woman and have her sit next to me it was such a conflicting moment um but I remember the next stop, I got off, I ran to the bathroom, I threw on some sweats, took my hair down, I, I put on a t-shirt, and I got back on the bus, and I'm like, either they don't recognize me, or they think I'm running away from home. <laughs> As an, an Amish girl who ran away from home. And that was my experience. So I got I got halfway being Amish to it, get down here. and um, That's the best story ever. And you were coming to our house. I was. Right? Yeah, you came and stayed with us. When you told us that story, it, mm-hmm. it just doesn't sound real. But <laughs> knowing you, I believed every moment because it was real. And in the moment, it just felt like the right thing to do. I didn't even question myself until the Amish family got on the bus. Then I thought, what am I doing? <laughs> yeah. So... Yeah, for people hearing this story, that's what made you a great counselor. You were just so creative <laughs> in, in doing that. Okay, so I had to tell that story, but f- flashback to Caitlin Raspberry. So you just fell in love with Brook Hill, fourth grade, right? You, you yes. loved it, had a good time. Yes. And then you came back. Can you name all your counselors? Mm-hmm. Put you on the spot here. Gosh, I don't, I don't know. I know that I was in the Palominos. I think Ashley, red hair. Yep. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. I was in the Bays, and I cannot. I was just thinking of her the other day, and I cannot remember her name, okay. and that's sad. But I was in the base, um, and then I was in the Chestnuts with Gabby Barton. Gabby Barton. Actually, that was my graduation year. I think was okay. with Gabby. Shout out to Gabby. Yeah, and I don't remember if there was another one or if it was just four years, and then I became a JC because I was ten. Okay. Yeah, I think that was it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then you became a JC. How many weeks did you work? Do you remember that? Did you do several summers of that? I did. I did two years of JCing, um, but I tried to get as many weeks as I possibly could. If I could be there all summer, I would have. So I know I did like four to five weeks as a JC sometimes. So and, and at that point, Joy was probably already a senior counselor. Yes, um, Joy was. Gabe was an AC. My second JC summer. Okay. Um, yeah. Yep. Then it, yep. Then you, Nick. Gideon, mm-hmm. more than that? Is that it? That's it. Okay. He's yep. the last. Okay. Yep. I love it. And they, yeah, all you guys were counselors all summer. Mm-hmm. It's so exciting. Yes. So w- w- what drew you back, right? I mean, I know you didn't come back just because Joy was doing it. What What did you love? What was your experience for camp? You know, because sure. I'm sure for Joy, she might say one thing. For, you know, for Nick, she might say another. But for you, what, what was, you know, what did you love about camp? You know, t- tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, well, first off, even as a camper, I was already just ready to be a counselor. I think that was from seeing older siblings and cousins being counselors. I was 
uh, at graduation, you wouldn't have found me crying. I was like, thank you. I'm ready. Counselor, next summer, that's me. I just wow. was ready. Wow. Uh, I think just hearing all of their stories and hearing all of their experiences and what it was like for them made it so enticing to want to come back and have those same experiences, you know? Um, so first of all, as a camper, I mean, you just feel totally welcome and loved here. As, as we all discussed earlier, I'm kind of weird. So, <laughs> so if I can be accepted in a place right off the bat and already have best friends, it's like, yeah, I'm going to be there every summer. You got it. That was a big pull as a camper. Um, but then as a counselor, I mean, is it was hard work at first. Being a junior counselor is is no joke. You you do some hard work. Also as a senior counselor or all summer staff, all of that is hard work. But it's fun and it's fulfilling. And I think going to bed like wiped out completely mentally and emotionally and physically is like a nice feeling. Just knowing that you did is so fulfilling. I mean, you did all that that day and you got to meet all these kids and all these kids think that you are so cool and you're their hero and for what you know it's like just making jokes <laughs> just uh, playing the bird game that, on hodgepodge that is literally jesse right there you were the queen you know honestly maylee but but your sister joy she's a she's the one that turned hodgepodge oh around. gee May hodgepodge maylee and then Joy, right? Okay. I feel like the two of them were the OG hodgepodge. Y'all made it cool because it was dying. Really? Yeah, and, and you guys made it cool. And, you you know, you just took Joy's mantle there. I could live and breathe hodgepodge. <laughs> I love it. Even hodgepodge, that, like, if, you, if you were to ask me to define Jesse, I would say <laughs> hodgepodge. <laughs> yeah. The activity of hodgepodge defines I'd you. I'd be okay with that. Yes. I Not love... Not basketball. Not not uh, water rides, not <laughs> no. fun swim, not horseback, hodgepodge. Right. Right. I only did fun swim because I was a lifeguard. But right. this is where I this yeah. is where I came alive. You probably were imprisoned up on that lifeguard stand. You're like, I'm in prison. Little, I cannot it was a little, be me. <laughs> but like that, yes. <laughs> this was a great summer. This was the summer I had torn all my ligaments and tendons in my ankle. What? I was I called you I remember it was like the end of May. I was wearing a cast and I was on crutches and you were like, well, do you think you can still do camp? And I was like, I'm not not doing camp. I will do camp. You were like, that's not even a question. Yeah. I'm not calling to tell you that. I remember the orthopedic surgeon was like, we might have to do surgery or we could just put you in a boot and see how it goes. I was like, put me in a boot. <laughs> Let's see how it goes. I did staff training in a boot. Wow. And then when camp started, I put that brace on. And that was why I had those awful lime green tennis shoes all summer long. It was the only shoes that fit my brace. And that was the summer I also had a bunch of fun swims and had to go up and down Fun Swim Hill. Of course. It was it was good physical therapy for my foot, I think. Um, <laughs> but no, nothing nothing could stop me from coming back to camp. I don't know. I don't know what it was. It just the need to be here was was great. Okay. And even when I became a, a nurse and I couldn't be here anymore. That was like the hardest summer knowing I'm done with camp. Like, right. That's tough. How bad do you wish that we had some of the, if you learned, you know, uh, just for those listening, Jesse actually is here because she's currently the nurse at camp for this week. Um, she's a traveling nurse, which I want to get into some of that, yeah. but how badly, you know, have you learned already the few days of being here, the different new leadership positions that we have that yes. we didn't have back then? Right. There's right? so many opportunities, so many people here. I was shocked. I think the staff is what doubled easily, like more than that, more yeah. than that. Yeah. yeah. I keep, I keep meeting somebody new <laughs> every day. I'm like, Oh, you're, you're a staff. Oh, some, okay, great. Nice to meet you too. Like, it's impressive how much yeah. you guys have changed and grown here as well. I mean, it still feels like camp. It's just there's you got to change with the times sometimes. So. so so it feels the same to you here. Like Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, it's the same Brook Hill cuz that's the worry of some alumni. Vibe. The worry of some alumni is you're ruining Brook Hill. They're not saying I mean, that's not what people have said to me, but it's the worry that they have, right? Yeah, sure. And so I've tried to do as many tours as possible to show them it's the same Brook Hill because it's fun connection, Jesus. Right. And that's what it's always been. Right. And that's what it always will be. You can be in a different building 
but it's still council ring. Yes, I think that's just the thing that we have to get past is that feeling of being in the pavilion, right? right. And doing council ring or doing cabin cleanup or cabin creativity, which honestly, glad that one's gone. So <laughs> <laughs> um, T- Tyler does not feel that way. <laughs> Tyler loved cabin creativity. I got pied in the face by Blake Bins every Friday because girls lost cabin creativity. And, and I felt like we were pretty creative. So... Obviously, I got a bone to pick with Cabin Creativity. <laughs> were, t- were you with Blake? Was it you and Blake and Tyler? Were y'all? Were, were y'all you were in that squad. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it was when he came back. Blake 2.0. It was Blake, Blake. The second tour. The second tour of Blake. Okay. Yep. Yeah, he chose me as his victim every Friday. I smelled like vomit <laughs> from of this whipped cream. And, anyways. Future, he he must have known y'all were going to be future brother and sister in law. He did. He, he had did. The, they yeah. were they were about to be engaged. Okay, so that that point, it really was okay. Yeah, it was like a month or two later when they were engaged. I think so. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a lot of shout outs to Blake Benz, which I am going to get him mm-hmm. on the pod, and he wants to get me on his podcast. We yes. just haven't had a chance to do that. I feel really bad. I'm going to make time this next year. I promise, Blake. Promise. And then we'll get <laughs> and then we'll get him over here. But I love Blake. Blake was one of my campers. Wow. For, fourth grade. He was in the Mustangs with me. Wow. Yep. I remember he was my fun swim counselor. Okay. And also he was, I JC'd his fun swim and there was no toilet paper in the porta potty down there. And he goes, hey, Jesse, can you go get some toilet paper? And I took that mission <laughs> so serious. I sprinted up Fun Swim Hill to get a roll of toilet paper <laughs> and I fell going up the hill. <laughs> I was that JC. You are that JC. A little too eager probably. <laughs> I came back and I was like, I got the toilet paper. He's like, well, don't eat it. <laughs> like, take it easy. You don't have to fall everywhere to get. <laughs> I felt so silly. Yeah. And now he's my brother-in-law. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I, I, I mean, Brook Hill to me was. I, I, I still feel like it has the feeling that it had when I worked here. When I came as a camper, even though there's changes where it's, it's something you have to get over just knowing. These kids don't really know any different. It's for them, the EC, the air conditioning, the canteen, what, like, you know, huts now that are there that are different. That is Brook Hill to them. Mm. And that's going to be what they remember when they're working it and when they're gone. And they're going to see a different change and be like, whoa, what is that? I remember when we did this in the EC, you know, and that's camp to me. But I, I can still see how these kids are getting loved and how they're having so much fun. I mean, even day one, I was here for registration and just seeing them like outside the car windows and out of their sunroofs, like with all their Brook Hill monogrammed matching outfits like they're that still they made that they made that they made before coming here. And that is the same that we had when when I was working here eight years ago. Wow. You know, and so the excitement, the feeling of camp is still there for these kids. It's just they know something different. Hmm. Some of them don't know Butch and Susie. Some do. Some, you know, it's just it is the way it is. But they're getting the same message. They're getting the same care and they're having the same amount of fun. Probably what we thought was fun wouldn't be fun for them now because kids like different things now. And so I still think camp is camp. I think it's great. That's a great point. I, I like what you said. You got to know each generation. I like what you're saying yeah. there, right? And and it takes this new generation of counselors to know what's fun to the because the jokes that I had would not land maybe with mm-hmm. these campers, right? Maybe some right. of the jokes you had wouldn't land with these campers, but this generation of counselors knows this generation of campers, right? But the whole point is to have fun, exactly, right? That's the whole point is to have good, clean fun. Yes. To connect mm-hmm. and to introduce them to Jesus on Thursday night, right? Right. And I think that's what's getting across no matter what the activity is, no matter what room you're in, no matter where the cafeteria is. It's still, it's still the same. And I, I, I think that's a, a valid point. Yeah, these counselors know the jokes right now going on. They know the humor going on. I I don't even have a TikTok. I, you, I mean, I don't know if you would want to put me in front of all these kids anymore. I, I might look foolish to right. them. Right. So it's, I think the changes are necessary to continue expanding, to continue reaching kids. And that's the totally. point. 
The, yeah. The, the point is not to keep tradition. The point is to keep reaching kids. Definitely. Right? And that's Hetty. I mean, that, yeah. that's what she did. I mean, what she did 60 years ago, we're not digging for bones in the, <laughs> bo- in the bone yard <laughs> now. So <laughs> that would be probably weird <laughs> for us. I think so. Maybe fun for a couple, right. but we had to train. We had to change that. I'm sure yep. she didn't have laser tag 60 years ago. No, so. no laser tag. So yeah, you just and people ask about story time. You know, she did story time, but yeah. and people are like y'all still doing story time? It's like you can't because story time is heady. Right. Story time is not something you can repeat. That's what she did, but she also did that because she didn't have all the counselors that we have today, right? True. She didn't have all the activities that we have today. You know, we we just have a different way of going about it. And yes. I, but I think it's important that you're always willing to change and grow mm-hmm. in order to continue the same message, right? The mm-hmm. method can change, right. but the message has to stay the same. Absolutely. And I think that's what we've tried to do. It, I think it has. I was at Vespers last night, and the messages are the same. I mean, e- I was at Devo's this morning. Same concept. Everyone's getting the same information, you know, just brought about in the way that works Right. for this group. That's right. Same so. Bible. Same Bible. Yep. Same. I mean, you know, nothing's changed. Nope. You know, it, it, it's just funny. The misconceptions, I think, that can happen, mm-hmm. right, mm-hmm. when someone puts up a new building. And it's like, uh, that didn't change Brook Hill. It's still, mm-hmm. you know, still Brook Hill. Right. So, okay, so you said, um, you know, how much you learned. You said you learned a lot in working, that you that you changed a lot. What do you think it is, uh, what do you think the effect is and why uh, that it that it does that? And what could it help other kids? You know, how could it help other kids? Sure. Um, I mean, there's not a lot of room to complain while you're here. Um, and I think that's a huge thing late nowadays or just even years ago. Complaining is a big thing in the workplace. Hmm. Um, and also, like, strife among coworkers. And that is just never something that was a problem here. I mean, I... I feel like I could count on one hand any issue that ever came up or any time someone really complained. It was like, let's try to make this. I think when you try to live something through somebody else, you realize what you what you want and care about just doesn't really matter at the moment. You're really hot. You're sweating. You're thirsty. You haven't gone to the bathroom in like five hours, you know. But this kid is here looking at you like, You've saved the world, and that is what makes all the difference. I mean, you don't really want to complain anymore. Um, Can you explain that? You said living through someone else. Will you explain that concept? Sure. I mean, every week we're doing the same thing, right? And that can get tedious, and after a couple weeks you're like, all right, we're going back to the fun swim for the 99th time in 10 days. Um, But each kid is different. Each week you get this different round of kids and their excitement is brand new. You know, you have to have brand new excitement for them as well. But even just seeing them and their like hunger for camp kind of fills you up and gives you that energy. And you start seeing it through their eyes. You start you start explaining, you know, you start yelling at cabin cleanup because it's funny to them, even though you did the same joke last week. It's not funny to any of the counselors anymore. Morning Devos, goodness, after three years of me up there, I'm sure I wasn't funny anymore to anybody. (laughs) (laughs) But different kids every week make you want to give your best Mm. every time. It's so good. And and so you're a nurse, and and I do want to get into that eventually, but you're a nurse. That seems like that could translate to you being a nurse, right? Living it through your patients. Oh, yeah. Because I think of a lot of people that have hospital experiences. Mm-hmm. And I think sometimes at hospitals, they act as if we as patients do this every day, and we don't. We're usually there because this is uh, a freaky moment, right? Yes. We're scared out of our mind. And I think sometimes they act as if, oh, this is no big deal. Oh, yeah. So I... So I work in labor and delivery. So I'm helping women have babies every okay. day. Okay. It's the same general concept for every woman to have a baby. There's there's basically two ways to do it. Right. Um, but uh, it's the same education every single time. These these women come in like, is everything okay? Is this okay? Is my baby okay? They're freaked out. Their parents. This is this yeah. is new to them. Yes, their parents are asking me a million questions because it's a new way of doing things for for them. 
And in you know, my day, we had these outside, right? They yes. always have these old <laughs> stories, right? Yes, or yeah, it's crazy. And sometimes right. it's like, you're asking me a question, but didn't you have her? Aren't, right. Isn't she your child? You had a baby once, right? <laughs> you just have to have a lot of patience, um, a lot of self control with your facial expressions and yeah. and your tone and everything. And there's a lot of nurses that come out and they roll their eyes, like, I can't believe she asked me the most basic question ever. And it's like, well. She's never had a baby before, you know, and we have to switch up our medical words to make it sound more for their understanding. And we have to be excited for them to bring in this life into the world, just like we were 10 minutes ago for our other patient in our other room who's doing the exact same thing. I mean, we're sometimes doubled up doing the same thing with two different people. And it is very similar to camp. I mean, every single day I'm doing the same thing in a slightly different way. Just a different personality here and there, different excitement level, different emergency level or or medical level, what if you will. Um, yeah, actually, that, it's very similar. That has to help you, though, Jesse. It has to give you a leg up, especially you're a traveling nurse, right? Mm -hmm. That is a traveling nurse, and that is so interesting. Mm -hmm. That has to give you a leg up as you bounce into these new places, right? Yeah. And, and they see you're a breath of fresh air, probably for some of the nurses that are there. Do you see that translate? Um, I, I honestly do. I get reviews at the end of my assignments, and they're, they're generally like, wow, she jumped right on board, had great teamwork. And I was like, well, teamwork, this wouldn't work without a team here at camp. I mean, teamwork is essential. And as a nurse as well, it's essential to have everybody on board. I've, I've worked at some places where it's every man for themselves, and I've, I've seen that not work out. Um, but, yeah, I think a lot of what I've learned from camp has translated over to my jobs in the not complaining, kind of jumping up and helping out. Not, not that I'm the world's best nurse over here, but, I mean, in some way it just feels normal to be the person who's like, oh, that trash is full, I'm going to take it out. And they're like, oh, we have someone for that. And it's like, but it's full now. You know, I mean, just like, right. but I can do it too. I do it at home. I can take trash out here. I you, can handle it. If you want. <laughs> yeah. Um, just little things like that. I think do, that. Do you run to the trash bin and have <laughs> like the people who it is their job run you down like the JCs do Absolutely. here? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you're like running. You're like, no. <laughs> yes. I, I, we're racing to get there first. Um but yeah, I, I think just the jumping up and seeing a need, you know, kind of get the job done. You know, it's right. not like, oh, it's there's a lot of people who will just do the bare minimum. Mm. Just get by. I'm getting paid for this and just this and that's it. And I see how they're I mean, I think about I'm currently pregnant. I'm going to have a baby in a month. If that were me in that position or if that's one of was one of my sisters in that bed, how would I want them to be cared for? You know, how would so I want good. someone to explain things to them? And that is something I have to constantly remind myself mm -hmm. that that is somebody's sister and that is somebody's daughter, somebody's friend. And they need that same care, regardless of how maybe frustrating they are or their family is or whatnot. That's and some days I really have to check myself at the door like, OK, this is going to be me in a month. What would I want? be that for that person and that's kind of how it was at camp I mean I remember being a camper I remember I felt all this like water running down my leg on the way to an activity and I was like what's going on and my Gatorade had exploded in my backpack and I had to go to the bathroom this was when I was 10 I didn't know anything it was like day one of camp and I'm like trying to clean everything and I just feel like overwhelmed and a counselor comes in she's like sweetie are you okay and then you know pats you on the back and helps you get back to your like you're the missing camper at your activity you know but just having somebody see you acknowledge you make sure you're okay like those things to me are so important for these kids that just walk around with these like lost eyes like where do I go what do I do I, I don't feel good who do I talk to those things are important to to see and to just jump in there and so I know a lot of it, yeah, translates so over if, into. If you wanted that, you know your campers are going to want exactly. that. Exactly. If you want that, you're going to know your patients are going to want that. Exactly. Man, it's so good. I just feel like if we could get back to some of that common decency, right? Mm -hmm. And I feel like camp brings that back. It does. So it just means everybody needs to come to camp. Every, that, that, everybody needs yeah. to come to camp. If I could 
if I could hand out coupons to the world That's to right. go to camp or something, I'm like, I truly think everybody needs to see this. I'm, I'm, it, it just teaches you so much. I love what you're saying. You're talking about, you know, you, you were talking about you could count on your hand, maybe complaining or maybe like five moments that were actually a big deal or whatever. You know, I try and tell our staff, you know, because sometimes when you get a staff this large, right, you're going to have personality conflicts, sure. right? And sometimes it may take us a minute to be able to get to them and coach them because it's, it's a little bigger. Um, but I'm like, okay, you don't understand when you get out in the real world, this is easy. This, this is actually a really good culture. Yeah. Then you get out, especially you're a traveling nurse. You see all kinds of people. Oh, yeah. You, you may go from great culture to tough culture to, I mean, you know, when you're going from. So yes. tell, tell us, well, maybe let's tackle that, and then, then I want you to tell me about being a traveling nurse. But, but, I mean, you know, the real world is out there. Right. And Brook Hill is tame. Compa- like, yeah. it's so funny. <laughs> These, like, three instances they have working here, and it's like a big right. deal. But then they go off, and then they come back, and they go, oh, yeah, okay, you, you are right. It, it's a right. lot tougher out there. Well, in here, you're kind of in your, you're in the Brook Hill world. For, for a summer, you know, your your mind is purely camp, purely kids, purely activity, safety, fun, Jesus, all that, right? That's not, you don't have all the things from the outside world attacking you right now with work, with emails, with bosses, with coworkers, with your family, with whatever. Um, so it's, it's, it's easy to get in this bubble and like have this tiniest thing be the biggest problem in your life. And then you get out of camp and you're like, Okay, wait, actually, this is a really big deal. And that was minute. (laughs) Like, I can handle that any day. Take me back. So. Do you think we have to have problems? Like, do do you think that, like you said, do you think sometimes we make up problems? I mean, I'm not saying that we we make that, like, like, we make them up in our heads. But it's like, this isn't a big deal. But because I don't have any other problems right now. Yes. I need to make that a problem. I was, I was going to say, I think when you get too used to something or bored or familiar with something it's almost like we subconsciously create more issues for ourselves and more drama for ourselves because what else is there to keep keep going you know I mean I think that's the the way it's way it is in anything in the work environment even in the world and in any scenario I think that's something that humans just naturally do I mean I so off the point my husband being from another country he's mexican Cole, you want to get her on this sorry go ahead oh okay go ahead you keep going that's good okay um so he's from a different country i lived there for a while and i've seen some real problems i mean people that have nothing and people that work six or seven days a week for 12 hours just to like have enough food to eat you know and then i think oh i make up everything to be so dramatic and an issue when i have everything I need. And I think it's because I have everything I need. I'm, I'm, I'm like needing to continue to advance in something or control something or, or or I don't know what that is, but I think what you said is right. Like we almost have this like make up an issue and it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. I mean, there are way bigger deals (laughs) in the world than what this tiny little trash bag is doing to you at camp on Sunday. Saturday. So, yeah. I mean, I've been to Honduras on a missions trip. Uh-huh. You know, your your husband's from Mexico. You go down. Th- y'all have a house down there, yeah. right? And you see people in real need. Yes. And like you said, I think it's so good. We have our needs met. Yes. And so, I don't know, we're prone to be people that solve problems, I guess. And so, we have to make up some so we can solve them. Yeah, I think that's it. When we don't have real problems. Right. So that that is so good. Okay, so you left camp and you became a nurse. Yes. And so did you ever have a stationary nurse before you became a traveling nurse? Yes, I was working in Fayetteville, Arkansas. That's right. Yeah, that's where I Blake finished and out. Joy and all that. Yes, yep. yes. I finished out school there and um, got a job right off the bat doing what I do now, the same labor and delivery. Um, and then I remember a couple of the nurses there starting to travel and I thought, wow, that would be so lonely. Like, I don't know how to be alone. Like that just sounds crazy. I could never do that. Two years later, I was like, get me out, find me. I, I was like, wherever you want to put me, put me somewhere. Um, 
at this point, my new obsession was learning Spanish and was Mexico. So <laughs> Amish be gone. Um, <laughs> I said, this time I want to move to Mexico. So um, I told my recruiter, I was like, put me as close to the border as possible. And he's like, how's El Paso to Texas? And I was like, I'm there. <laughs> so <laughs> that's where I had my Says first no job. Says no one except you. Everybody spoke Spanish. I was the only gringa working there <laughs> i'd go into my patient's room they all were mexican and <laughs> speaking spanish i learned a lot working there it was really fun really busy but and is, is that where you met eric no okay. um i i was there for a few months then i took another assignment in uh california while i was in california is when covid hit um i was actually there april of 2020 so things were weird. I mean, it was like everything was transitioning in the hospitals. And I remember I kept thinking, I really want to be in Mexico. I had actually just finished an online class um, on getting certified to teach English in a foreign country because my idea was I'll go to Mexico and teach English and I'll make a lot of friends and meet people. And, you know, I'm not a teacher. I I know nothing about it, but I'll do it. That's fine. <laughs> we'll figure it out. <laughs> so we'll we'll play hodgepodge games in English and then they'll learn. Right. Um, so well, with the pandemic happening, school shut down. So I lost my avenue in to Mexico and um I found a different way. I thought, hey, I'm good with kids, so maybe I could be a nanny. And so I looked up and they have these live in nannies, au pairs, if you mm -hmm. yep. Um, and so there was a family in Mexico that matched with me and we got in contact. They had three daughters and I moved down there. So I took a little bit of time off. That's where I met my husband, Eric. Um, he was their tennis coach. In the town uh, that, that y'all currently live now? Yes. It, what was that town called? It's called Merida. Merida. It's in the Yucatan. It's close to Cancun. Okay. It's That's in the right. Gulf. That's what he told me. So. Yeah. Yeah. And he told me most people in Mexico don't know where Merida is. It's not... It's it's not like a huge tourist city. Kay. It's not a big. I mean, the Yucatan is kind of like its own thing. They almost wanted to be their own country for a while. Mm -hmm. You're like a Yucatecan before you're a Mexican. Interesting. I, and then, I mean, obviously they're Mexican, but right. it's just they have this mentality. Mm -hmm. Like they got their culture. It's very Mayan culture down there. Which so. makes sense because his name. Actually, his name is Aztec. Aztec. I know. It, it, he's That's different. That's different. <laughs> he's just, he's everything. <laughs> he is everything. Yeah. So. Um, he's also my tennis coach. <laughs> he is now your new tennis coach. He I is love my it. new tennis coach. He this was my week. tennis coach. <laughs> yes. Ah, that's okay. Yeah, me and Eric are best friends. We spent, uh, gosh, we spent like five hours together on Monday. <laughs> I know. First day, I was like, are you down to ride in a car with a guy you've never met before? And he's like, yeah, that's fine. Yes. He's just so, yeah, sure. He doesn't say no to any opportunity. I just figured the girl who wore an Amish outfit <laughs> on the bus probably married someone who wouldn't mind the first time he met me spending five hours with me to play tennis. No. I had a hunch. No, I actually brought him back from Mexico um, after being there for 10 months, I kind of knew this is the guy for me. I brought him back to my family and he lived in my parents' basement while I worked three hours away. <laughs> and so I would just text him, how's it going? Good. I'm just watching a movie with your dad. <laughs> He's just like alone with my parents, hanging out, eating salads and watching movies. With <laughs> I'm just thinking, you're a great person to just be thrown into that. And have the best attitude about it. So, I found a I found a good one. <laughs> Absolutely. How long y'all been married? Uh, three years in three August. Years. Yeah. Congratulations. Three Thank years you. in August and baby boy baby on the boy. way. Baby boy. Yeah. Okay. One month. That's exciting. Yeah, we're excited. It's it's. I think we've I think we've been ready for a while just because I mean. A lot of the times when we're traveling, it's hard to find this sense of community and sometimes things to even do. In certain cities, there's been nothing to do, you know, and sometimes your coworkers aren't the people you click with to go hang out all the time. You know, like you said, you meet different groups of people every single time. Um, and so you have to re find a church, re find a group of people to hang out with or not. 
So kind of having the idea of we're going to keep traveling eventually and have somebody with us. And it's almost like we're going to have a little human to, to play with, to hang out with, to keep us busy and maybe even introduce us to other forms of community around us. So we're excited. That's yeah. so fun. What all cities have you been to so far? You said L.A., mm-hmm. you said El Paso. Mm-hmm. Um, San Francisco, Sacramento, a couple places in Missouri, and Hawaii, actually. Wow, those are really tough yeah. cities to have to live in. Really hard. <laughs> Goodness. <laughs> no, the worst one was probably Missouri because we went in the winter and it was like negative 15 degree wind Whoa. chills, blizzards, and he's like... That was right after Hawaii. That one was tough, but um, we wanted to be close to family. So the good thing about travel nursing is you can kind of swing it to benefit you. I mean, you're kind of your own boss in a way, and you just pack up, pick where you want to go. Go south in the winter, north in the summer. Yeah. That would be a smart way to do it. It would be, (laughs) except we tend to go (laughs) back to Kansas City for the winter because it's the holiday season. And we think, oh, then we don't have to buy all these flights and have all this time off and issues with work. It's like I'm already here with my parents, so I'm I'm home. But for my tropical husband, (laughs) it's a little bit. I bet that's freezing for Aaron. (laughs) He hates it. (laughs) (laughs) He hates it. We went skiing once, and just wearing all the garb that you have to wear, he hated that. (laughs) He's a shorts and a T-shirt kind of guy all all year round. So we'll 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 figure it out eventually. We'll figure our our rhythm out. But I love that. Yeah, I love that. Anything else with camp? You know, what what do you feel like camp taught you? What what do you feel like the legacy of Brook Hill is? You know, what it what did it teach you? I mean, I know you've shared some things here. But what does camp mean to you? Um, and any, any any stories that you can think of that really describes your moment here at camp? Yeah. Um, camp to me is is like a family, honestly. I think I will I, – I remember stepping on the ranch on Monday this week and just feeling like, oh, I'm home. I never left, you know. People come up to you and hug you and welcome you back. And, I mean, it really is truly a family away from family. Um, And even me having been blessed with such a a wonderful family, just to feel that way here as well is – it's huge. I mean, you just – you feel it. When you step on here, you are wrapped in arms of so many people. And that, I think, is the best depiction of of Jesus and who he is and his gospel too. I mean, just like, welcome home. Like, you might have had the worst year ever. Welcome home. You know, and I think that is something that so many people need um, and deep down desire without realizing it. And so I think that's really why people come back. Um, And having Brook Hill just be in my family, too, is huge. Just to continue to feel and and revisit those stories with everybody. Um, I think that's the legacy there is just seeing how it's affected my siblings my cousins, their lives, their jobs, their kids, you know, it's like, wow, this is a big deal. I mean, this place is special. It's different. You know, I have a lot of friends that have worked other camps and other camps are fun, but it, they don't have that same like sentimental feeling when I talk about camp. It's like, it's like when I want to tell somebody about Jesus, it's like, oh, how can I express what it really means to me? to know the Lord. It's almost the same as like, how can I express what Brook Hill really means to me? You know, and in some way, I just think it's so similar to the gospel. Um, I think that is camp's legacy right there. Um, I think I've learned obviously my work ethic, but just like how I want to raise my own kids one day or how I want to treat other people every day. I remember like, being in the car on the way home from camp, I think we started arguing about something, my siblings and I. And my mom was like, did you do that at camp? Was that allowed at camp? And we were like, no, ma'am. She's like, then it's not allowed here. She's like, get it together. (laughs) She's like, she's like, if you're going to act one way, one place and another way, another place, then what's the point? You don't need to go to camp anymore. You know, I mean, those was like, okay, that's real. And I think that's huge. I mean, you have to really think like, okay, I'm I'm being somebody here, and I want to be that same person out there too. Mm. And so 
like I want to be somebody that David Pate would be proud of in the hospital. Mm. I want to be somebody that Lindley would be like, good job. You know, like just as much as I want that with Jesus, like good job. It's, it's just a very similar kind of feeling, not saying camp is Jesus, but <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> but you just, you, it's kind of just about character. I think it really builds your character. Camp does. I mean, you're doing a lot. It's hard work some days and you're like a 24 seven mom or dad to kids and you're keeping them safe and you're keeping them cared for. And that's a lot mentally, emotionally, whatever, as, as an 18 or 19 year old person to be in charge of that much. I mean, that's huge. And you want to still continue that outside of camp as well. And I think it just really is a character shaping place. It just really prepares you for so much. So you're saying you love camp. That's I it. love it. <laughs> I mean, I, I literally, when you ask me, do you want to come work camp as a nurse? I'm like, I'm <laughs> like more than eight months pregnant. Do you care? I will be there <laughs> like whatever comes my way. If I get the opportunity to come back and just get to be in that environment one more time, I'll never say no. I love that. And and we love just there's so many places now that the alumni can get involved. You know, we have the the Brookhill Children's Fund. We have, you know, just the traveling nurse. We're now doing security. I mm-hmm. mean, there's just so many ways now. Yeah. We have now these I mean, we have people on staff who are teachers, you know, in Fayetteville or in Louisiana or whatever, you know, people are all and then they come back for the summer and still work. Mm-hmm. It's so cool that we have that. Yes. And to bring you guys back, to do tours. You know, I, I just feel like one of the things we've tried to improve is bringing our alumni back to us. Yeah, so know? fun. I think that's so. a great idea. I know all my siblings are jealous that I'm here right now. They were like, take a video of you driving onto the ranch. <laughs> show me devos. Show me counseling. You know, whatever. And so <laughs> I know that anybody would probably jump at the chance to get a week here again at camp and get I to experience that. that. I love that. Yeah. Well, Jesse, I want to thank you for being on the podcast today. I think you're hilarious. Your stories are always so fun. Um, And so I just, I appreciate you being here and uh, uh, hopefully we'll get you back some, sometime uh, in in the future. So yeah, thanks for being on the podcast. Life Legacy Leadership with the Jesse Metz. Teutle. Teutle. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks.